Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Season 3, Episode 11 of Mind Clickers, where it's time to click both heads when in 2022. Today, I am joined with... Uh, I'm very happy for this guest today. Uh, very happy to jump on and have a chat with Dig Nick, RLCS coach for Dignitas. How are you going today, brother? I'm doing great, man. I'm excited to be on here. I've watched these for, like, ages at this point. Oh, a long-time viewer, a long-time listener. We've been talking <laughs> since, like, season one, man. We've yeah, on we're, we're talking since the beginning, you know, and, and I think, you know, I talked to you before the show as well, and um, it was funny because, you know, I was thinking yesterday, like, uh, I had a bit of a flashback to the time where um, I was trying to, you know, I was, I think it was early days of Renegades, and I was looking to get some, I guess, Rocket League guests on. I was thinking, who can I get on? And, you know, I, I came across yourself, um, and then we had a chat about uh, sort of what we can do for Mind Clickers. Um, and that obviously led to, to having Jack on as well. And, and now we've almost come full circle because now you're obviously <laughs> coaching Jack. So it's funny how that works, doesn't it? Yeah. At that point, I was only like, I only recommended Jack because I knew he liked to just talk on podcasts. And we had a few like small conversations, but Jack and I weren't really like friends at that time. But I was like, hey, I've, I've given this dude two or three sentences. I'll just pass them on to you. See what happens. It works, it works. If it doesn't. Oh, well, I tried my best. That's it, but it worked well. It worked good, and uh, I guess we've come, you know, as I said, full circle. Um, you know, we've had Joe on, we've had Greg on from from Rocket League, and I've got some more, I guess, Rocket League coaches lined up. So it, it feels like I'm almost turning into a Rocket League podcast, but I don't think I am in that far yet. So um, we'll see how we go in that regard. But um, I'm very excited today to, I guess, learn a little bit more, I guess, about your past history because I don't think we've had a chat about that too much. Um, and I'm keen to know, I guess, what you did before, you know, Rocket League, if there was a time before Rocket League and I guess your mindset on a few topics, you know, uh, that we kind of share as a coach. Cause I think, you know, a lot of coaches sometimes butt heads about things. A lot of coaches agree about things. Um, so I'm really interested to see where you stand on a few different things, which is uh, going to be cool. Yes, sir. All righty. So I, I guess what we always do, and I'm sure you know about it. We always do the intro arc on mind clickers. Um, so I guess take us back. Where did it all start? I guess within esports, or you know, your interest in gaming, or where does it all stem from? With gaming, it started with FIFA. I want to say. Oh, no, it okay. started with Mario. It started with Mario. I only got into FIFA because my dad forced me to buy FIFA 2010 World Cup South Africa instead oh. of Super Mario Galaxy when I was trading in other Wii games. That's the only reason I ever got into like soccer and FIFA in general. So that was my first like actual game I played. Yeah. Five years later of FIFA and pretty much only FIFA, Rocket League came out. And that was free on PlayStation. That's the only reason I got it. So all my FIFA friends forced me to buy it. I was like, hey, there's this new game. We're all going to play it. So now you have to play it. And it's like, all right, well, I don't have much of a choice here. So I guess we'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I got into Rocket League. But it was only because I wanted a balance from like trying to full grind FIFA and get really good at FIFA. Mm -hmm. The issue with FIFA was like, I don't know if you've ever played like any EA game or any sports game. You can only control one player, so it sucks. Yeah, it's just awful. You're just relying on the AI ninety percent of the time. So I quit FIFA. I I, I hated. I think it was FIFA seventeen or eighteen. I was just, I was done. Okay. So then I like fully converted into just only playing Rocket League. Mm-hmm. And then this was also when I was doing coaching at Manchin with my soccer team, like my high school team, because I was a soccer player. Mm. And then I realized, all right, yeah, I'm not good enough to get a college scholarship. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not the best player. Let me go into managing and coaching because I like the backside of the game and I like understanding stuff. Yeah. But that's how my mind works is I want to understand everything. I don't want to just get an answer. I want to know the how and the why and mm. where it all came from. And I guess that kind of goes to my personality because I think I have quite a, I'm not obsessive personality, but addictive where as soon as I want to, I care about something, I want to know everything about it. Mm. Uh, so that's where it was with soccer or football. And then eventually it turned into Rocket League with playing. Gave that a shot for two years. I wasn't good enough. <laughs> it was like B plus. Okay. Uh, and my friend gave me a shot coaching and working with his team, which was... Oh god, what was the name of the old team? It, it became Team Meteor. It was whatever team okay. was before that. That was with Adam. Because Adam is someone who I ended up learning uh lived like ten minutes from me. Oh, which wow, was even okay. crazier. Yeah. I had only known him online, but he was like, Yeah. Oh yeah, by the way, we both like live at the same place. Wow. 
All right, and that's how my coaching career started, was off of that, where it was, it was more just a friend thing. I was helping out, and it worked out really, really well for us. Mm, interesting. I like that. I think that, uh, funnily enough, I feel like a lot of people started in FIFA or started in some sort of sporting game and then transitioned into Rock League. I feel like I've heard that story a few times. Um, it's just it's like it's soccer into yeah. soccer, but it was better, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and, I, and I guess I love to sort of reflect back, you know, obviously when you, you picked up Rocket League for the first time, did you ever envision that you would be, I guess, in that competitive scene where you are now? Nah, man. I still remember, like, me and my friends trying to grind for, like, plot. Like, or, and, like, my friend's <laughs> promo game and I played Batmobile and I threw. Oh, hey. And got mad at me. <laughs> I thought I was cuck, so it didn't happen. Oh, well, at least you gave it a crack though, right? Eh, better to have tried and failed than to never have tried at all, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so obviously you started coaching a little bit. You started getting a bit of a tease for it. When did you feel that like you knew that oh, yeah, this is something I really like, this is something I really enjoy? Probably Fusion. Do okay. you remember that? Were you, no, were you even in the scene? Though? No, I started 2021... Oh, yeah, I was yeah, in like 2020 was, early. Yeah. yeah, this was mid 2020, early 2020. Okay. This was with Adam, Kiri, and Austin. Because originally it was me, Adam, Hockey, Kiri, and then we kicked Hockey, which is kind of funny because I ended up coaching him later in my career, and we're still <laughs> really, really good friends. Yeah. Hockey was always supposed to be my like protege. All my friend groups said because we used to always watch replays together for hours. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it started off with me kicking him. Or me and Adam basically kick him. So that's what we felt was best for the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we beat Cloud9 in Fusion because we got carried by Sharp. Right. Who is a ones player. And I guess it's more relevant now because the Gaming Without Borders tourney has brought back Fusion. Mm. But if you had a good ones player, you actually just won series. Yeah. We scammed a threes game against Cloud9 and then we just won two ones mm. game and it was over. <laughs> It was unreal how we did that. I think it was on CJ's channel as well, which made it even better. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, because he was one of the streamers. And then we got to the qual match. We lost to SSG, which happens. SSG were demons in that tourney. Mm. And then we ended up losing to Vision, which was Beast Mode, Kinsei, Redoko, which looking back, that team was gross. Yeah. Beast Mode and Kinsei on the same roster. That's Very pretty nice. Yeah, that's pretty sick. Go next. And for a team who had no experience or, like, no real... The closest they had got was one series off our LRS. Like, we were making good progress. We also had, um... What was it? Spring series, I think. Mm-hmm. We got top 20. Top 20, top 16, something like that. I know we beat Zookeepers and now Accelerate. Mm-hmm. And that was, like, the first time they ever did it. And, like, I'm sure you experienced as well. The more you play in tournaments and the more you're there, it's, like, dead. Once I get that taste of winning, like I don't want this to ever go away. Yeah. It's like a yeah. 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 That's no. where I was like, man, I want to keep winning. This was fun. Yeah. I think it's weird for me because I think when I look back, like I never had the intention of, I guess, getting into Rocket League. Like I was previously coaching a little bit of StarCraft. Um, I was chatting with some guys about COD and stuff like that. But I guess Rocket League was that game that I just jumped on with the guys and sort of, you know, at the time I was a mouse and keyboard player. And I was like, and they were telling me to get it. They were like, get a, get a, get a controller. You'll be 10 times better. And I'm like, nah, I'm not spending 25 bucks on a controller for a game. I'm never going to play again. But it's funny how things go full circle, isn't it? Um, and now I've got multiple controllers. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's just weird. Like I never thought about it. And I guess, you know, obviously the the way that I got into it was a very fortunate way. But yeah, it's, it's I, I definitely agree that once you get that taste of whether it be winning uh, I, I bet your first best of seven OT or whether you, you win your first like you know you make it to championship Sunday it's that weird feeling and it's like you don't want it to you, you want to continually be in that feeling um, just ride that high so I definitely feel that with you for sure um, but yeah I, I guess that's also interesting because obviously things can't always be like that right we're going to have those downfalls we're going to have that upsets so we're going to have those times where things don't go our way um did you have that much as a coach back then and and you know the way you handled things back then is that sort of the same that you do now or has that changed over time back then i think i can i swear on here no yes you're fine okay uh i d- 
definitely didn't have any balls back then. Uh, right. That's how you swear, but it's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I was more just like, yeah, where it was more just like trying to be a supportive person mm-hmm. and help. It wasn't until like Crimson Wings where I really started like doing full on coaching. Yeah. Okay. But it also helped like when I was uh, first starting out, like we were a team with no expectations. Like we were a team most people expected to be like top 32 and we were a consistent top 20. We were dominating weekly, so it was a really good team. And then we all got opportunities and then left, which was stupid. Mm-hmm. Looking back, which, uh, you know, uh, that's what happens in the bubble scene. One person gets a tryout and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to take a tryout because I don't know if that person's going to leave. And leave like, or not. Oh, now I have to explore other opportunities because both my players are trying out with other teams. And it's like, well, damn. Mm, yeah. I, I, it is what it is. Yeah. I, I feel like in a way it's sort of like, I understand it, but it's also like, you sort of think about it like what if this team stuck together for an extra you know an extra couple of months like could it there have been a lot more potential could we have reached a new level sort of thing does that ever cross your mind i guess back then literally that's literally queso yeah literally like yeah i mean vatira and joyo both had the offer from guild after the first split which i think i can say because they both they made the roster move anyway so it doesn't matter yeah they both had that they both turned it down and Rise had the Giants offer, which, looking back, fair play to him for turning that down. Because obviously we were like the better team at the time, but even still, they were mm. on like they were on like five times our sell. Yeah, that case, so they were on on real money. And like for a younger player like them, I, I don't know if I personally would have been the person who's like, yeah, let me turn that down. Mm. When we were like a top ten, lower top ten team, it's like. Okay, we had the potential, which obviously we saw in the winter, but even still, fair play to them. Yeah. To have that, like, restraint and to trust what we were doing so much because, man, when I was 15, 16, I was stupid. <laughs> like, I, I probably would have taken it. Just, like, at the end of the day, like, it's a life-changing amount of money. And yeah. Especially the eSports. Did you end up seeing the Shaq video that uh came out today? I did. Where he's, like... What's that one? It was, it's just basically like esports athletes have like a five, six year shelf life. So like f- they're mm-hmm. athletes in his opinion, like he has mad respect for them because men, it's a true facts. Like how many pros get cycled out after like three, four years? Yeah. We talk about it all the time, and don't like, we? Awful, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I guess, yeah, it's one of those things where to, to, you can make comparisons and contrasts between esports players and esports athletes and traditional sports athletes, and you're always going to have that that same old, oh, you know, you know, esports athletes aren't actually using any physical, you know, aspects towards you know who they are as an athlete, and you know they got all these sorts of rebuttals. But at the end of the day, you know, you look at a, a traditional sporting team, and they have how many players on a team? They have 10, 12, 15 players. On an esports yeah. team, you've got three for Rocket League. You've got five for League of Legends CSGO. So the competitiveness to be on a team and actually to sort of understand, is this the right team for me, I think is a very hard thing to sort of deal with. Um, and it's a very hard thing. Like, you know, that's why I have that, you know, sort of respect for, I guess, the boys when they were sort of acknowledging, hey, you know, we've got this great offer, and, you know, and that's really tempting. But I guess they stuck it through and they saw it through to the end. And obviously that sort of paid off for them. Um but I think it's hard because I think I agree with you. I think a lot of people would take that extra offer. It's like, oh, you know, this is a level up. This is an upgrade. This is almost an augment on what I've been doing and working on for so long. So why not go for it? Yeah, and it's also just, okay, maybe it hasn't quite worked out. Let's give it a chance. Mm. I, it's also like, I don't know. I think the other example, like this season, has probably been Almid, if you've heard of them. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, where obviously they just qualified for Saudi Arabia as well. Mm-hmm. But that was a team that they didn't make it out of day two of qualifiers the first five events, and then they made three like main events in a row until the last one. And then they made Saudi Arabia. Crazy. I don't know how many teams would have actually stuck that out. Like that was unreal that they care that much. Like you have to be a different type of person to really trust and believe that much. Mm-hmm. And I feel like maybe it maybe it's age plays into it as well. Just because it's all younger kids, and I mean, I said I was dumb when I was young. There's obviously certain pros that are like when they're young, they're just different. Like their maturity level is unreal. Like it was Joya, mm. Joya when he came into the scene, his maturity level was unreal. Like mm. his dedication to work, his trust and his ability, he was just different, man. Mm. But Crazy. I think that plagues esports more than 
traditional sports just because of the age. Yeah, the age. And I think the age of, of, you know, we're seeing a lot more esports pros be a lot younger. You know, we're seeing them in the 15-year-old, you know, age bracket, 16-year-old, just absolutely dominating. And I think that only just creates more motivation for the guys that are 13, 14, right? To think, hey, you know, they're that they're a few years older than me. Why can't I do that? And a lot of those guys at the time, what, 15, what's that, grade like eight over here, grade nine, they've yeah. got that extra bit of free time to, I guess, put into a passion project like esports or, you know, really give it that red hot crack. Whereas, you know, you look at a 22, 23 year old or somewhere around there and it's like, well, you know, do I have enough time to really invest into this? I always wondered that just because I feel like if you're going from the start, okay, maybe if you're 22, 23, you can't, but yeah, I don't know. I, I watched a documentary on Hiko the other day. Oh, the, I think I've seen that same Score documentary. Esports? Yeah, yeah, it's a good it's one. Good. They have so many good documentaries. I'm again in the CS. I like CS. Yeah. But um, yeah, like he, he gave it all. He quit. He dropped out of college at like 22, 23. Mm -hmm. But that's much more of a, an exception rather than a rule. But I think it's possible if you still have the passion and you're already in it to still continue. Yeah. Like, sure. man, I want to see in five years if like the age range is like four or five years higher. Mm -hmm. I, players like Garrett aren't just going to fall out of meta. Players like Justin Squishy. Yeah. The older Nap Chicago, like they're not just going to drop off because they hit 24. It's like, no. Turbo. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Because you look at CS, I think if the average age of CS players is like 25, 26. Like, I look, look at FaZe. Some of those guys on the FaZe team that just won the major, I think Carrigan or just Rain 30, is like 32. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I, but yeah, CS has been around 20 years. Rock League's been around what, That's true. Six, six, five, give or take. Jesus, seven years, I think. Mm. Unreal. But that's what I mean. CS has been around for 20, 25 years. Rocket League has not had that chance to grow and develop. Do you think Rocket League will grow and develop into the same level that CS is? No. Not, not CS level. I think it can grow and develop a lot more. Yeah. I think everyone's waiting on UE5, mm. which I, I think there's still changes and updates they can make now, even without UE5. That would improve the game and improve everything. But we'll see. Mm. What is UE5 even going to bring, though? Like, I haven't really read into it or chatted too much about it, though. Do you know much about that? I think I think the big thing people are hoping for is just, like, customizable maps and the ability to just create on the game. Oh, so, I mean, okay. Rocket League got stale. Or, like, gets stale at times, just, like... So, it's the same game. It's the same thing every game. single time, yeah. There's no but, massive meta changes yeah. or patches. Yeah, like, at least CS Val, there's different maps, there's different heroes, there's different... There's a change, right? It's not just same map, same thing. Like, um, uh, I probably shouldn't say that actually, because I know they were talking about changing stuff for next season or trying like stuff in off season tourneys, like in different formats. Mm, okay, that is. I mean, I guess we're seeing that with Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah. So, That's yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I guess yeah. On that topic, Saudi Arabia is a really interesting one because I remember. Yeah, I remember this distinctively. I remember chatting with Jack um, and, and we chatted about how important or how, I guess, interesting one's tournaments would be or, you know, that, that aspect of having a, a 1v1 sort of game mode if it was, you know, the crew battle, which sort of is now. Um, but the fact of, you know, sort of developing as a one's player initially when you pick up the game and then rotating into a three's player, do you think that one's players have a lot more foundation over, I guess, someone who, who jumps into the game as a threes player and is just constantly always known threes, never touches ones? Individually, yeah. Because ones just pushes you mechanically a lot more yep. than threes does. I mm -hmm. mean, but that's common sense. Uh, a game mode you touch the ball more is more. always yep. going to be more helpful, right? Yep. Like, that's all it is. It's just touch, it's repetition. It's why, like, pros don't... Or you don't see a ton of pros, like, grind ones, but they also don't grind threes. All they do is twos. Twos. Because you get the space to work, you can play the game, and you get a ton of touches. No. It's not just bang ball, one touch, bang ball. You can play on the ball. No. So I think that's why we're going to see some really interesting... Like, I'm really interested to see some of the matchups that come out of Saudi Israel. Just, just of, I guess, specifically, yeah, the, the twos and the ones aspect. Just of, I guess, people that I wouldn't have, I guess, been able to 
I imagine seeing them 1v1 against or, you know, have twos against, it's going to be really interesting. Saudi's so. weird. The only thing I don't like about Saudi is you could have used a sub in qualifiers, but the sub can't come to land, mm-hmm. which I find so weird that you can only bring... I don't know, because that was exploited like hell in Fusion. Oh, I know, because we did it, yeah. Right. Teams would just pick up ones means and be like, yo, play ones, that's it. Oh, Go enjoy. yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that's what we did, so. It works, um, but well, it's boring. Didn't didn't um, Old Mid do that? Didn't they pick up a ones player? They picked up Chronic on the pure fact he was supposed to play uh, the lower qualifiers at day one, right. I think. Or no, the lower bracket of day two. Maybe. Mm-hmm. He had to play something because Asian area uh, Angel at finals. Oh, like okay. it, it wasn't a play one, so it was just because he was best friends with Flitz and they needed a sub. They needed someone to pop in. Yeah, I gotcha. And then it was like, hey, Gronik, we're in lower bracket. You want to play twos and ones because you're the best out of us in it. But if we make it, it only be if we can fly you out. And you're not guaranteed, mm. which is fair. I mean, that's kind of expected when it's with your team. Yeah, for sure yeah Saudi's definitely an interesting one i wonder if um you know i, I definitely i'm wondering if there's going to be because i know that obviously there's na and eu i'm wondering to see if we're going to see any of these oce teams or if we're going to see any of these sam teams making an appearance it's going to be really interesting because i think that would stir the pot a little bit as well getting some of those guys who who maybe spend a bit more time in ones or twos out there and, and sort of testing them against the big dogs that'd be interesting man imagine furia Period would be demons. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yan card. Oh, go next. Go next. But I mean, I'm also. Do you think that Falcons is going to just come out and, and sort of have that sort of home home turf advantage of of being on in that sort of area? I don't know if it's home turf advantage. More so, just like I mean, that team's done lands. So is Veloce. So is zero one. Like, there's so many lands in Saudi Arabia. I don't think. Yeah. But. Maybe for the younger teams, like the lower Saudi teams, it'll kind of help, like having the culture there. Mm-hmm. But the big dogs, like they've been, to, they were there at Sweden. They should have been at LA. Like it's just, just another one for, another them. for them. Yeah, that's Falcons it. Be really good though. Gross. Yeah, yeah, that was sick watching them in Sweden. So I can't wait to see what they bring in Saudi and Worlds as well. I guess so. But um, man, I hope Veloce make worlds. I want I want to see my boys there because I helped them for uh, regional one. Oh, did you? When I was I wasn't locked with Dig, and I oh, didn't know okay. if I had the Dig spot yet. So that's who I would have went with. Oh, right? all right, gotcha. Hmm. It's yeah. It, it's so interesting seeing. I I guess that aspect of of from the ground up. You know, spending a lot of time within. You know, I guess the bubble scene, and then obviously going to magnolia then going to queso then now arriving at dig it's i guess i'll leave that to the end actually that's sort of an end question um but what i want is i guess your perspective i guess when you were on queso and you were starting to make momentum you're starting to push through the eu regionals you're starting to get a few dumps you know what was the mindset then was it just let's just keep doing our game let's just play our game let's just you know let's not change anything what was what was that thought process I think I want to say it was Rise that said it like the first day of scrims back after regional one it was like you kind of just had that aura about you like man we're the kings of Europe <laughs> like we did we did it right and that. like the, genuinely that ego boost of okay you can tell yourself man we like in split one right I remember this sect it pissed me off six oh, okay. of our nine losses were uh to the major teams and the top three teams in europe which were bds dig and endpoint uh-huh so that that was annoying six of your nine losses are to the top one two and three seed yep okay that's on us then to break through and then the other one was regional two where we were having internal problems but we sorted that out for regional three nice so it was like man but the thing is in split one we went one in eight I want to say in game fives in main event. Mm-hmm. And it's like, damn, uh, we, sw- we win three of those. Three of those were in Sweden over uh, Vitality. Yeah. And it's like, man, that could have been us. And it was that close, but we never, like, we could always tell ourselves we could do it, but we hadn't done it, right? And there's that difference of saying you can do it and actually doing it. But the one game five win we got was in regional three, and it was against Misfits. And that was the first time we had won a game five in a main event. And it was like, 
okay, now we've done it. We can do it. Yeah. And then you saw the streak, and it's a streak even now. They're like, they are demons in game five, game seven. It's just don't face them there. Because they just <laughs> won't. They have that confidence. It was always, we can drag a team a full series. Yeah. But we didn't have the ice. And once you win like two or three in a row, it's like, all right, it's just another game for us. Mm. And I think that also goes into the mental of other teams, like, especially at LAN. Where we had that like unreal game seven record, and it's like, no. Well, now we got to face them in game seven, and <laughs> yeah. it's like, dude, now what? You got that small advantage over them, right? Yeah, it's just a mental gap. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I always watched other players' cameras because I found it interesting. It was easy to tell how people would react. So did I. Love that. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can play on it, right? If someone looks angry, or they look frustrated. You'll be able to tell in their gameplay ninety percent of the time. Yeah. It's just that reassurance. Mm. And what was it like? Uh, I guess before LA, had you been to any other LAN event, or I, I guess for I guess any I've other games or any stuff? I've been to Jersey for Worlds in season seven. I yeah, think. that was unreal. Uh, that was the one Vitality one. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's funny like meeting a lot of the people that I'm still friends with today, or uh, actually I have it on my desk. What and my controller got? signed by all the pros. Oh, let's see who let's see who we got in here. We here got Justin, go. Sunless, Ronicky, Cassio, Rizzo. Dang. Uh, who is that? I have no clue. Bluey, Fruity, Chaussette, Chrome. Ah, oh, to me, Chrome was great. Mm-hmm. Fairy Peak, Kada, Torment, Fire, Violent Panda, Squish. Like all these players, right? Jeez, how many can you fit on one controller? That's a lot. Mate, it is absolutely filled. Uh. Oh my! Is that like the show controller? You never use that now? No, no, no. It already had a broken button, so uh, I had stick drift. But it's never getting used anyway. But I gotcha. I always keep that on my desk as a reminder. It's it's just wild. Yeah, and it's kind of crazy because I guess back then you were a I guess a spe- uh, you were a spectator, but now you're up there, right down the front in front of everyone. How did that feel? Different so so different yeah like uh the first night at the hotel i was nervous man <laughs> people. i was like man i know you guys <laughs> like yeah like i remember i ran into rizzo uh because we we're both trying to get on the elevator and i had, had no idea how to start a conversation because i knew <laughs> no one no one knew who i was so i was like hey man you're rizzo right and it's like yeah i fucking obviously know who you are but it's like <laughs> how do i start a combo i it is what it is yeah Dang. I remember I ran into Garrett in the, in the elevator. And I can't. I literally cannot remember a single word I said to him, but we had a full-blown conversation. Cannot remember a single word I said. But I think it was just like, oh, hey, I mean, Garrett, it's just me and Garrett in the elevator. What do I say? And so I just, yeah. But, it's so weird. But yeah. But I, I guess if I reflect back, like I remember when you boys came out, like you had that confidence. You know, you, you know, you were walking around, you were sort of enjoying it and you were sort of enjoying the moment. And I think that's one of the best things you can do at LAN, and I think that sort of just helps with that confidence because, you know, I, I guess I haven't experienced it yet, but, you know, what it's, what it's like looking out into a massive crowd, and I can only imagine what that is for a player. Um, but what was that like for you? Uh, kind of nice because uh, no one was rooting for us, so I feel like we had, like, no expectations or pressure besides pressure Love we that. put on ourselves. Yep. But we also were like, okay, we trolled day one, so it was already like pretty much impossible for us to win the land, which sucks. That, that's the worst part about bracket reset and like how mm-hmm. it's ran. Like, on land, you get five minute breaks because it's ten minute breaks, but it's okay. It's three minutes once you're actually off the stage. Three minutes to walk to your practice room. Two minutes to walk back. And it's like okay, so I got two minutes really as yep. a break. In a break, it's awful. <laughs> uh, that was my biggest frustration with psionics, and I told them that. Because I told him before the SSG series, no matter who wins, we need an actual 20 minute break. Mm-hmm. And it just for like show must go on. It's like, yeah, it's, that's how you like burn out your players. Because we hadn't eaten at all. 100%. Like, and we got there at 8 a.m. And it's like, dude, just give us a little break, please. Yeah, 100%. But, um, we we're talking about talking about the crowd. Uh, Yeah, we had no pressure or expectations. It was just like, let's play. Let's see how we can do. Let's Send use it. this as a learning event. Yeah, like have fun with it. Because we were like the real pushers of the have fun meta. Also, Rise completely made like an unreal call to throw Joyo in the middle. Because mm-hmm. I 
I was kind of, they were Rise and Vatir were the ones fighting over who should be in the middle between each other. Yep. Uh, and then obviously Joya was not the most confident day one, so we threw him in the middle. So the other two could kind of surround him, like very similar to what SSG did with Daniel. Yep. Uh, so first of all, fair play for Rise and getting that right, and then Vatira for accepting it and just saying, put Joya in the middle, let him do what he wants, be confident, and it worked because we beat FaZe. And we were always using that day two as a test day. If it worked, it worked. If it didn't, Okay, we played endpoint instead of NRG and lower. So at the end of the day, you got to beat who you got to beat, right? Yep. Yeah. It's funny. I remember after that phase series, AJ was like, "At least we don't have to play NRG." But that meant we got to avoid BDS in top eight, which BDS had our number. So it's like, <laughs> uh, okay, we help you, you help us, and then bam, we faced in top four anyway. So <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is at that point. Love that. So that's funny you mentioned that as well, I guess, putting a player in the middle because, you know, we made the decision to put Fever in the middle for Sweden because um, obviously CJ and Kami being, you know, land vets, you know, it was just sort of that. I think we played, we were playing with the idea of, did we have, I think we were in our scrim rooms, in our practice rooms in Sweden and we had Fever on the left side. CJ was in the middle because we thought, you know, CJ, you know, has that sort of confidence he can allude to, to Fever on the left side. But um, I think it was... I think it was funny enough, I think it was CJ's mum who actually messaged CJ and said, what if we put Fever in the middle? And I was like, yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense because obviously, you know, being the land vets, we can sort of, you know, he can feel a little bit more in control and a little bit more comfortable. Um, and then obviously we went on to beat Endpoint day one. Um, so I think that was a massive one for us, just having that sort of bit of confidence to sort of take advantage of the situation and that we can easily manipulate. Um, but I think it's a big one. Um, and I see that J-Cube's in the chat who's actually... Um, if you don't know JQ, he's actually an intern for the Renegades. He's actually going to Sierra Worlds for Oakland. Um, so he'll be up there on stage. Um, so I definitely know that he'll love this convo that we're having now, just taking a bit of different pieces, <laughs> taking your perspective. Oh, we've got Bass in here as well. Love that. Um, but I, I think one of the interesting ones that I want to touch on, because I think about it myself, is finding the sweet spot of comms as a coach. Um, and I guess, you know, some coaches are really enthusiastic with comms, whether it be, um, you know, post-game or in between rounds. And obviously, you know, you've got a bit of experience this, obviously going between games at the major, um, you know, being, you know, going from top top eight, top four, to obviously coming going a top two. Um, where do you find that sweet spot? How do you know when to tell, you know, say a bit more? When do you know when to lay off? What is it from your perspective that gives you that little bit of a hint? When we were having a lot of success, the main thing I was doing was facilitating. Because mm -hmm. um, just we kind of had an issue in the first split when people would try and relay information. It wouldn't be in a constructive way; it'd be more in a destructive way. Yeah, so that's where I would have. I was also doing a lot more coaching in the first split, where I was trying to do too much. And I mean, how, how old are you? Oh, mate, I don't know if you want to know that. I am twenty-five. Yeah, so you're normal for an esports coach. You're like, I swear every other coach is like this 23 to like 27, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the young kid. I turned 20 after we left LA. Oh, okay. Like I, so you are yeah. young. Yeah, okay. And uh, it's something I mentioned with Dig when I was like first going through the interview process with them. Like, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm younger. I'll, I don't have that maturity per se, mm -hmm. whether it be with experience or just as a person. I make stupid mistakes. Um, but I also kind of have that youthfulness and I, I think differently I think but um it was more just how could I not say too much whereas I used to overdo it and I think that's probably a huge mistake well it was a huge mistake so try and overdo it mm -hmm. and I feel like a lot of that's a hard thing is a like new young coach because you haven't like cause coaches don't talk to each other at all ever mm -hmm. like um I had my first like full conversation about like ideas and just how we are as people how we treat our team with chrome last night that was only because we were in different regions but that, that's my first time ever sitting and talking with a coach maybe eclipse we that was more me listening than me talking mm -hmm. uh, and that once again comes down to experience and it's like i don't know i definitely overdid it a lot more than i tried to now i try to be a lot more simple with the yep. dig guys especially because they haven't had a coach before mm. uh so it's different. It's a full different thing. If you try and overdo it, then they're just going to shut it out from the start. Whereas if you're kind of like easing it in and getting slightly more and more each time, well, 
it's a lot easier to go from zero to one to two to three than from nothing to a hundred in one second. You just can't do it. People can't do it. Um, yeah. That's probably a big thing I'm trying to balance and get right with Dig. Mm. Uh, I don't know. With, with um, Queso, is easy because they were always super motivated. It was just getting people to share their honest opinions and share it in a constructive way. Yeah. And get them refocused. Like, I know it kind of became a meme, like, watch the fake, watch the Spanish, but it's true because it makes you think. And then once the point they became a meme, it was kind of like that relaxer, like, okay. We can laugh about it, and with 10 seconds left in a game, if you're laughing, you're relaxed, you're not going to go, okay, maybe I shouldn't go for the ball because I want to defend and play safe. That's like, yeah, I'm comfortable. And it worked. Mm -hmm. We were comfortable. We played well. Mm, I love that. I love the fact that you brought up facilitating because I think that's a massive one. Um, I think some coaches try to just overcoach, try to look at the situation too in depth, and I guess... It, it, it works well in my situation because obviously I come from a background with minimal Rocket League experience. So I'm able to sort of just let the boys take the rein because they know best. You know, at the end of the day, um, they know best. They know they know what's best for them, specific situations, specific rotations, what works for them, what doesn't. And so I think if I'm unable to have that input of, hey, you know, I think you should rotate this way and pick up this boost to, to you know, specifically do this, that would be adding to the confusion, I think. Um, yeah. so I think being able to facilitate it in much more of a simple way, um, where you are bringing about the conversations, you're starting the conversation, you're starting the, you know, how did that go? You, what do you think about that? You're just kickstarting what is essentially providing them with helping them understand it and evoking their own understanding about what went wrong, what went right. Why do I need to do this? Why do I need to, you know, sort of have this mindset in a game seven, then it's sorts of, it's sort of. You know, almost plant the seeds because then they're able to sort of rephrase that and they look at it back and you know a lot of you know what we were doing is like looking back at Sweden you know what do we do then okay we did that okay how do we do that why do we do that what can we learn from that and I think now to look at back at previous experiences is a big one um, because you know that's how we learn right you learn from previous experiences what went wrong what went right and I think you're able to sort of develop that attitude towards what works a little bit more clearer um but it's a big one, and you know, different coaches do it differently. Um, but I think it's a very interesting one, indeed. The facilitating thing's interesting. I remember there's an interview. I want to say with Garrett and Sis, definitely mm -hmm. Garrett, where he was like, Sis would throw out ideas, and we would sometimes just tell him he was wrong. Yeah. But it would have that idea of okay, now we're at least discussing why he's wrong and how we feel. Exactly. And like yeah. as a young coach, I was like, man, they disagreed with me. I was like damn i'm stupid yeah. but i feel stupid and it's like okay it's not always a bad thing like you can turn bad things into positive experiences to exactly. motivate yourself mm -hmm. as long as it helps the team it's all right to be wrong and make mistakes yeah because one of the big things was i remember i was throwing things out in a scrim once um and i think it was the most basic thing i was just like explain this to me and they're like what do you mean how do you not know that I was like, just explain it to me then. And they're like, oh, okay. And then actually force them to explain it. So they were actually sort of developing that understanding a little bit better themselves. And I think there was one point where I said something um, and they were like, oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I think we used to do it that way, but we do it this way now. And they sort of develop their own reasoning for what they do. Um, so I think that's, that's yeah, that's a really big one. And I look forward to, I guess, seeing how you go with Dig now that you've got that previous experience from Kaysa, and I guess, you know, a lot, what I just said, you know, you've learned those lessons on what works and what doesn't, um, which is, you know, only positive, right? We, we yeah, stand exactly. forward. You live and learn. That's it, it is man. That's what it is at the end of the day. That's it. That's it. Love that. Um, now, I had an idea of, um, you know, obviously – one of the big ones, and I think it's it always happens, um, and I think it's really good for I guess rock league coaches to I it's not really rock league coaches, but I have a chat with all coaches about this as well. Is this sort of dealing with an attitude, and I sort of how can I rephrase that? I think um, a lot of people, a lot of coaches, even players, even try and brute force an attitude. Um, whether that be trying to maintain that perfect attitude, trying to um, deal with whatever it may be and trying to have that absolute perfection about it. Um, and I know that you love to do things, you know, the best that you can. 
Um, so when things aren't going that way, how do you sort of deal with it? And how do you sort of understand that, hey, no, this is okay. What if I do this? What if I do that? Uh, just dealing with bad things in general is, and this, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. I have quite an addictive personality just in life with whatever I do. Mm. So after regional two, the first thing I did was I, obviously I chilled out for a bit just cause I was you know, like, I was pissed. I was frustrated. Yeah. Um, and then I sat and watched our entire event back. I made like three pages of notes just between each series, every single thing I felt. Mm. And it wasn't like, okay, we have to fix all these things. That's how I got my ideas out is I listed the time. I listed my opinion and I moved on to the mm. next play, the Love next that. play, next play. And then I went back the next morning. Uh, Cause I was so sick as hell. So I, I read, okay. read some of the stuff back and I was like, Hmm, I don't know what I was trying to write there, <laughs> but uh, I, I read it back to see if I could understand it properly. Cause yeah. if I can't understand it properly, they, they got no chance. Right. And then I gave my more broad and general opinions with video or like with, uh, not videos yet, but like with ideas. And then we went over it as a team. Uh, me personally is I just force myself into it more work and just get it right. Like, I, I don't want to be that person. That's like, okay, I can take a break reset. Like, no, I, I, I dive fully into it and I go, okay, we are fixing this now and we are going to fix it. It's not like we can put it off. It's like, I, I also think I'm quite a confrontational person. Mm. Good or bad. Yeah. That's something uh, I didn't really work well with Queso. Uh, not necessarily with the players, but with the organization about things. Gotcha. Where, uh, I don't know, maybe that's cultural American versus Spanish, because Americans are kind of known to be assholes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I'm quite a confrontational person, so I, I give my opinion, whether it's right or wrong, and sometimes wrongly. Right? Mm-hmm. But I do give that emotion, and I do give my honest opinions on things where I just want things fixed. I want things fixed usually in my way. I I will listen to other people, but as soon as their way, I don't feel like is right or it hasn't been working. That's where I tend to take more of the reins. Uh, When things aren't going well, I mean, you can look at us now. It's going shit. Like Mm -hmm. there's no point of trigger. We have not been good. Yep. Uh, Obviously, there it plays into it with regional one with Jack's situation, and then that continued into regional two. Mm-hmm. But there was an issue. Like all of us had low hours coming into regional two, which I take part of responsibility for. Uh, but Jack was still mourning, and when one person isn't motivated, it's very easy in a team of three for that to happen. It's something you were talking about earlier where it's like, it's so different to manage a team of three guys versus 22 Mm -hmm. like soccer. Yep. If one person's not motivated in 23, it's like, all right, you can kind of get away with it, right? You can drift under the radar. If it's one person out of three, man, that's like eight people in a soccer team. That's That's like 33%, man. That's almost 50%. (laughs) Yeah, it's awful. It just, it rubs off on others, especially... If it's more of a leader like Jack is in our team, it's like we needed to figure it out. Yeah. And one thing we made very clear is coming into regional three, we we won't let it happen again. Like we cannot let the hours and motivation happen again. Mm. If one person's going through hard times, it's on the others to try and help motivate, but also keep themselves aligned. Yep. Even when the situation sucks. Because mm-hmm. man, like. It sucked because I'd been with the team one day before regional one, literally one day. Yeah. Uh, and then it, <laughs> then that happened. So uh, it all kind of came down to regional two as our first real event together, and it just went awful. Mm-hmm. Right? There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It went awful. But can we change it? No. Can we learn from it? Yes. Can we still make London? Hell yeah. So that, that's all we can do is push. Yeah. If there's the situation where, okay, we go out, we win regional three, but the other three teams get the results they need that we finish six. Who cares? Genuinely, who cares? Because mm-hmm. we, we've shown we can do it. We've made the progress. We know what we can do to win. Right now, like, regional three is more of, like, a test subject than anything. Yeah. Let's win, but let's see if we can execute our style properly and how we want to do. Mm. 
Because there's no point of just like trying the same thing over and over. We've analyzed, we know what to do, and we just got to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I relate to that, man. Because I think it's the same thing as itself with ourselves. Um, and I know I mentioned this, I think it was, I mentioned earlier in the episode or before we chatted. Um, I guess, you know, we were looking at ourselves and um, obviously regional two, not the, not the result we wanted. Um, obviously now we're third. So, you know, obviously for OCA, we're a little bit more capped. So we get two spots to a major. Um, so obviously, you know, we're one point behind KCP. Um, so literally all we can do is just play a game. And, you know, we had a little bit of analysis and we sort of had a bit of a discussion on what works and what doesn't. And um, I think, you know, sort of what you said, you know, I had a little bit of look back and, you know, just tried to find our style. And we just found that regional two, we just weren't playing our game. We just weren't playing, you know, our game. And I, I said, I remember distinctively before we went, before the end of Sweden, <clears throat> I literally said the same thing is going to happen for every single player in Sweden. No matter what, no matter who you are, you're going to close your suitcase, you're going to close your hotel door and you're going to walk out and you're going to jump on a plane. No way, no way you look at it. Everyone's doing the exact same thing. So we can either do that and be actually a little bit happy with how we performed and feel pretty good about ourselves knowing that we gave it our all, knowing that we had that red hot crack or we can just close that door with our head looking down and feeling just, you know, sad, like, you know, what if? What if we tried a little bit better? What if we, you know, experimented? What if we were, you know, fearless? What if we pressured a team like we'd never pressured a team before? Um, and sort of that what if was playing it with our minds, like, oh, you know, what if we do that? You know, what if? Um, and literally that's all I wanted. I wanted just them to, to just to, I guess, you know, meet me out for, out the front of the hotel with our suitcases and then for them to look at me and say that they gave it their all, that's all I wanted. Um, and that, and then at that moment I knew, right, you know, this is it, let's do it. Um, you know, and obviously we had a fantastic land. Um, obviously it didn't go as well in, in LA, but, you know, we understood what went wrong there, which is I think is the best thing to, to know what went wrong. Um, and now we're looking to hopefully go to, go to London. So, but we'll see how we go. All you can do is try your best, and like literally what you said. Um, at the end of the day, you know, a, a team has to lose, right? Um, exactly. And that's just one of the things that happens. Um, so all you can do is just give it your all and just see how you go. But um, it is an that's interesting thing. Yeah, that's the big thing. As long as you give it your all, it's like okay. If I half-assed my hours and I came in on like 40, 50 hours for a regional, it's like, okay, did we lose because I was not good enough individually? Was it because I couldn't execute what we wanted to do because of my hours? Or was it, it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. And that's where it leaves that like, the rock unturned and it's like, uh, yeah. what, what, what truly works? Because now you just wasted time because yeah. you're going to have to try it again to see if it's one or the other right and that that's the big thing as long as you give 110 you put your work in you tried to do what you tried to do and you execute it it's like if it works it works if it doesn't okay then we know we don't do that again yeah that's right hmm what was it like um i guess experiencing you know obviously I don't know if, you know, I, I guess you don't have to give the full-fledged answer, but I guess we sort of had a chat about before. You know, obviously, um, coming off Queso, you know, a ton of wins back to back to back to then come into, I guess, your first, you know, almost heavy loss. How did you feel about that personally? What, against G2 or when I got kicked? Um, when you say heavy loss, which one? Yeah, maybe, yeah, against G2. I think against G2. Because I guess at that point, were you in a position where it's like, no, we've got no expectations. Let's just full fledged, you know. The G two, it's G two for God's sake. You know, what was the mindset for you and the boys? I think I think the first heavy loss was honestly V one, where it was like, damn, we should never mm. lose to a team like V one because mm -hmm. they they were not as good as us. V one is not as good as Moist, and I'll stand by that even now. Yeah, yeah, fair point. I, I don't think that's that bold of an statement, right? Because I mean, one got top two at the left. Yeah, but um, at the time it was like, man, how do we learn from this? And because we have to learn quick, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. got really blessed. Day two was a test day. Where, it, okay, we're going to lowers either way. Because as much as we had faith in the detonator boys, 
He didn't have that much freedom in the detonator <laughs> voice talk. But... <laughs> Man, they were, they were the nicest people at land, though. I love those guys. Hey, y'all. I was trying to hype them up before the P1 series. I was like, you guys got this. You win here. They then win. Yeah. But even still, right? We used it as a test day. We learned from it. Uh-huh. Um, but losing to G2 it was kind of like, okay, we got the bracket reset. Mm, you knew All they were the available. Odds were against us. And it's like, and we could have won that, but we didn't. And that's the truth. Could have, but we didn't. And it's like, okay. I remember um, I told Viteria when, uh, after he stopped uh, crying. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. it hurts now, but if we win Worlds, it's all going to feel so much better. And you're going to look at this as like a learning moment or just an experience. It's like, you got to look in the future. Mm-hmm. This is your first time playing on stage. It was my... It was all of our first times, like, actually at a land competing. So it's like, whatever happens, happens. Like, we learn from it. We use it as an experience. I know I remember I also talked with um, Rettles, and that was their big mindset of, we're gonna just going to use this as a preparer for Worlds now. Yeah. Like, with Daniel, because obviously it was his first land. What works on land? What doesn't? We use it as a test subject, which sounds so crazy. And obviously it worked for them as well, because they got top three, and they were really close to top two structurally i think they're probably better than queso but Mm -hmm. individually it's just like impossible to stop that team when they're on their grind yeah moist i mean that's like all right fair enough but i don't know i i think i assume they learned a ton from that land and just motivation and everything is like it's that confidence of going into the next one and i'm sure it helps in the regional one they had five yeah five straight grand finals which has only been even come close to by G2 now. Mm. Yeah. In the ROCSX era, and it's like, damn, fair play. Yeah, that's crazy. But, uh, yeah, L- LA was just... Obviously, it sucked to lose, but we were happy with second. It was like, okay, we, we know we can beat them. We know we probably are the best team in the world. Mm-hmm. This didn't come off on the day, and you can't really fault yourself with that. We had put the hours, we had put the work. Didn't come off. Oh, well, we tried. Yeah, you know. for sure. I know that obviously, you know, you're not coaching Viteria now, but I, I guarantee you that he's going to he's gonna carry that with what you said to him on stage for a long time. Like, that's going to be a massive thing for him. I know it, for yeah. sure. That or he didn't hear it because of the crowd. <laughs> I, I have been. Hey, either one. He, he may not remember it, but if it, oh, well. If not, oh, well. But that, that kid has an unreal future in this game. Mm. They all do. They all do. The, that'll be a fun at Worlds or at London to play them again. Definitely. That'll be a team I want to play. Do you think, I know it's a weird thing to sort of think about, but because you've coached them, do you feel like you have an advantage on them? I mean, the thing with Moist is they were never like crazy good structurally. structurally. Mm-hmm. They, they don't have like, a, not necessarily a play style, but they have a lot of tendencies and consistencies. Mm. but at the end of the day a team like that like sometimes you're just gonna get out individual because yeah. of their talent crazy individual mate yeah but also teams can just win like ssg probably should have taken that series on us yeah and i i don't think any person in the world would say individually they were more talented than moist mm-hmm. but they had probably had a better game plan but sometimes individual talent just wins in this game yeah it's, it, maybe it's not as developed as time before the show about like cs and stuff where okay you used to be able to get away with super teams but now it's like okay you need the brains and you need to have that structure in the gameplay which eventually i think rock league will go to but not yet still in the infancy yeah yeah for sure i think um i think a really interesting one as well as i guess after the major because of you know queso was looked as as you know essentially the underdogs by so many people um and I remember, I think it was Joyo, he said, you know, we're just going to have fun. You know, we're just going to go out there, we're going to have fun, we're going to be confident, we're going to have fun. Um, and I think after that, <clears throat> I chatted with a lot of teams and a lot of teams sort of took that as motivation, you know, sort of adopting the queso way of just having fun, being confident and just playing us. Do you think that that can sometimes be a, a harmful thing looking at other teams and trying to replicate their play style? Or I guess, you know, if you're you know, a bubble team looking at a top team, is it okay then to sort of get some ideas about their play style and stuff like that? 
Uh, it depends how much you do it. I I remember we used to watch like it was me and Joya mostly. Mm -hmm. We watched like the BDS Vitality Championships back in the off season, and we all we saw was these two teams respect each other so much. Mm. They don't like do anything crazy, and it's like we're gonna be that scrappy underdog that fucking takes it to these guys <laughs> genuinely because it was boring rocket league yeah like eu last season was not good because no one tried to beat bds at all mm -hmm. and it was boring it sucked taking things from teams is good also looking at teams and going okay this is an issue they have and trying to exploit it even better the issue with the have fun meta is you genuinely just need to be really good friends and have that mentality mm -hmm. like there's going to be a lot of teams where there's either interpersonal issues or maybe just it's not the environment that they thrive in because some people are locked in. That's it. Don't fist bump me. Don't get hype. We're playing. That's it. Yeah. I don't want to laugh. I don't want to joke around. This is serious. I am serious. We win. That's it. And then there's other teams where, obviously, Moises, they have fun. They relax. They enjoy it. They are enjoying themselves, and that's what makes them play better is because – they're just confident because they feel like they're in a safe, comfortable environment. I don't think it's bad, but you also have to just realize, like, this isn't, like, a one-size-fits-all. Like, you can't look at one team in any sport and go, man, they just defined everyone. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, there's positives and negatives, but mm. if you're just trying to copy someone, you're always going to be worse than the original. <laughs> Yeah, at least in my eyes. Yeah, sort of chasing that elusive goal that doesn't exist almost. Yeah, and it's just like I don't know. It's you can adapt things, right? Because that's every game and that's every sport is you can take things from people and you can adapt and you can take the best from each thing. But if you just take one thing, it's like okay, you're just trying to do the exact same thing as someone else. Mm -hmm. They're already doing it. They're going to be better at you because they've been doing it for longer. But... Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Dang. Interesting. No, very interesting. Um, Another one that just caught, sort of come to my mind is this whole idea of uh, I'd be interested if, if from your take, if I guess Joe or any other boys – um, had it, or maybe even if if Dig had, it, or maybe we can keep that close on Dig. But this whole idea of placebos um, right. and being locked into one thing, and obviously for Rocket League, one of the biggest ones is car design. You know, banner title, banner choice, banner title, profile photo, all these things that have to be the same. Um, but I think you know, and, I, and I, I've said this a, a ton in a ton of episodes, um, and obviously from you know traditional sports, I've got so many examples that, that fit the solution. Um, I think having a placebo can be good and bad. I think it be, can be good in that it gives you that internal confidence in that you know that everything's okay and you can feel a little bit comfortable. But I think it can be bad if you get too comfortable. And I think there is a very fine line between that um, because obviously if you don't want to change, then you know, you're sort of restricted. You know, It always must be this way. Um, but then if you lose or if you lose a massive game, it's like, oh, I lost because I wasn't using the same car design. I wasn't doing this. And then you start focusing on the things that are actually the problem. Um, so what's your take on placebos? Because I'm keen to hear it. I'm a placebo person. Oh, I remember right. at LAN. I remember at LAN, I shaved for day one because I knew I'd be on the camera. Uh, <laughs> and like, yeah. I had to make sure I looked good. And then we lost. I was like, oh, well. And then I'm I didn't shave I didn't anymore. <laughs> day two, I just didn't care and I didn't shave. Then we won. Well, no shave was like, in one day. No, 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 but you can start to feel like the stubble oh. like on your face. Like it's not smooth, you know? A little bit of what you got going on. <laughs> <laughs> what Jack's got going on. That's awful. But no, nah, my, my face oil grows in fast. Like four or five days, I have like this weird, like patchy. It's bad. Mm. So, so from the last day it was chalk i looked awful but we were winning so i think <laughs> my confidence was good but um i don't know it was something we talked about a lot on queso where it was like if joy wouldn't feel confident i'd just tell him to use a car design that he played well in like two days ago and he'd be like all right mm -hmm. and be confident I, I don't know how much it honestly helped him but he would always seem more confident mm. but the dig guys there's a few placebos but not as much mm. 
the big thing would probably be about Yoris. Like, he feels like he only plays good on a certain hour amount. Right. But, Interesting. I haven't heard that. Yeah. So I was like, all right, then get higher than that and see. But don't turn your hours on. Just play the game as much as possible. And I always wondered if it was it was because his hours were streaky or, like, because there's a big difference, at least in my eyes, to playing 10 hours one day, two hours the next day, one hour the next day, and then nine. Definitely. Whereas, like, four, five, five, four, six, right? Where it's the same amount Definitely. of time, basically. Yep. Because you're not burning out, and you're also not taking breaks. It's just, I play the game. And I play consistently. Mm -hmm. So that's the big thing we're trying with him, is he also had issues with motivation or just confidence. So I was like, all right, let's figure this out. That was the big thing coming into Dig, is we need to figure out, like more of a structure for the team culture and a team environment because it was really poor. But we're working on it, and it's been better. It's been a lot better the last, like, two weeks. Like, mm -hmm. it's been so much better than coming in. Awesome. It's coming in, like, I mean, people have heard the comms. They're very awkward. And it's something where now we're more friends. We're hanging out. We're enjoying our time together. We're enjoying scrims. Mm -hmm. there's positivity and when you get that little like gleam of hope that positivity is like man we can do anything yeah i trust the guy beside me that's if it you, I, I i don't know how bds were so good as they were without mark being able to communicate mm -hmm. so now they've come out because i i don't know how they weren't they wouldn't just turn on someone or they wouldn't have the trust in someone because you don't have that trust if you're not friends mm -hmm. you don't even have to be like that great of friends you just have to be i respect you i trust you yeah. I will look out for you, you look out for me. Simple. Yeah. And so then we're really implementing and it's working out pretty well. Awesome. Now it's just if we can translate it in an attorney. Yeah, for sure. Do you guys do I guess do you guys play games outside of scrims? Like do you catch up and like we used to like we we like sometimes just like getting on Discord and like watching a movie together and just like doing random things outside of scrims, or is it very much right now it's scrim time and then I'll catch you boys in the next scrim session sort of thing? we've done it more like the last week and it's something they never did like okay now now it's changed so i can say it or whatever they never had like a team discord it was just they had a group chat they'd say scrim time so that's it oh really they yeah they, they oh. wouldn't like hang out that much like especially last split now it's like yeah i remember even oh, was it today or yesterday i know we scrimmed by top i think it was today we had a scrim at five and six est yeah our five canceled all we did was just chat about the most random theories of the world for an hour. Love whether that. ghosts exist, whether aliens exist, whether they're in this dimension or not. It was just like, if another team listened in and be like, what the hell are you guys Oh, well, we get that. Yeah, we do that as well. Love that. Or even like Tuesday, we were, we sat, or Monday or Tuesday, it was one or two. We sat and we watched the qualifiers for Gamers Without Borders together for like an hour. Mm-hmm. So we finished Scrim, and I was like, man, the series is on. Y'all want to watch this? Yeah, might as well throw the screen share on it. It's like, hmm. One or two sit in free play, but they're just hanging out. They have that. They're in the conversation if they want to talk, but they're still there just chilling. Yeah. And it's a much more healthy team environment. It's good. It's positive. Mm-hmm. You're working on it, right? And that's the big thing. You're all committed. Even if you're not doing that much, if you're there, you're committed. It shows you're committed and you care, and that's perfect. 100%. That's massive. I'm so, so glad you touched on that. I think it's a massive one. Just having, even if, yeah, even if you're just like kicking back, chilling, doing a bit of free play, at least you're there. And I think, you know, the other two know that, someone else knows that. Everyone knows that. Um, and I think that's the most important thing because they're the small things that you sort of reflect back on. You know, you probably reflect back on maybe, um, you know, two months' time. Hey, remember that time we'll just randomly talk and crap about ghosts? And it'll be just that funny little thing you can sort of, all relate to um and i think being able to have that relationship is, is so important so important because yeah, if you're in a team environment where people don't like each other they're not gonna like the game they're not gonna want to work hard for their dude this because that's also a thing like if you can motivate yourself to go okay i want to do it for not just me but for the team like it's all in for the team man you you're gonna do well because now you remove that selfishness as well. And it's like, man, I will do whatever it takes so we can all succeed. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's just the early stages of developing that key team culture. And then eventually it's just that uh, culture and that's just the normative. That's just what we do, you know? That's what, what we it do. Is. It is what it is. Another day in the life. That's it. <laughs> Love that. Um, now, I had a bit of an interesting question that I was thinking of and I think I was going to say it towards the end. So I think now it's perfect time to sort of start to wind down a bit um, towards the end. I guess it's obviously way too early to call it. We're in the early days, here, Nick. Um, but, you know, looking at maybe 10, 15 years down the line, where do you see it all going? Where do you see the envisionment? What do you picture? Me, the game, what? You, what just you, you as an individual. Oh, shit, dude. If I can still keep doing Rock League coaching in 15 years, man, I did something right, right? That'd be but, a um, <laughs> I don't know. I'll probably be out of the RL scene by then. I, I don't know if RL is going to last 15 years, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, especially with the way it's going right now. But I don't know. I, I'm doing college as well. I'm going back. I took this semester off just to focus on Rocket League. Nice one. Which, man, that, that low-key worked out because my old school was awful about dealing with me leaving classes for RL or skipping because of tournaments. And stuff. Oh, dang. How was that? That would have been, yeah. Bad. I rem- okay, I remember uh, we had a boot camp in Spain, right? Uh, so I left for <laughs> this a week. is going to be good, yeah. Yeah, this was during the fall semester. I left for a week. I came back. My school then required the, um, what's the COVID test that was not the 15-minute one, the long one? The one oh, you have to wait like 24 hours. Oh, what, the PCR? Uh, isn't the PCR the one you get in like 15 minutes? So? No, like, that's, like, that's like two hours, 90 minutes. The, the rapid no. antigen's like the 15 minute one, isn't it? Oh, uh, it was whatever one took like 24 hours to oh, get back. Oh, like okay, so like the full time. one. Yeah, yeah. Which sucked. And it was so stupid because I had to take a test to leave Spain in general anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I had taken the test 24 hours before, but then I had to wait to get another one and then come back. And they basically told me, like, yeah, even though you're leaving for work, and they had recruited me for esports and for Rocket League in particular, they were like, yeah. If your teachers want to fail you, they can. We're not supporting you at all for leaving to do this. And it's like, you brought me here to do this. <laughs> and I'm working in what I'm studying. And you're like, nah. Yeah, if we want to fail you, we can. And it's like, dude, Dang. thank God I had good grades. Thank God I had good grades. Because if not, I was like, I probably would have failed my last semester. Which, that's why I left. I was just done. Yeah, yeah. The new school I'm at, I, it's much more of like, I'm helping recruit, I'm helping consult, I'm helping grow the program. It's a lot more esports committed people that want to build an esports program rather than a school that just kind of see it as like existing mm. as like a potential money maker. It's like, all right, l- let's commit to this together. And that also means, okay, when I have to leave to go do blah, 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 or whatever, right? They're going to be supportive. They're going to say, all right, yeah, go on, go do that. And eventually it'll probably be a bit more on the managerial side and a bit more of like not coaching but on the business end of things, which is ideally where I want to transition. Mm-hmm. I think with Big, it's a really good spot. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I have a couple, multi-year contract with Dig, which is nice, but also just the, co- the connections with Dig is unreal. Mm. They own the New Jersey Devils. They own the 76ers. They own the stadiums. It's like, no, y'all are. Who's in there? Like, (laughs) okay, if this spell goes well, I can kind of prove I'm good on a company level and on a business side as well as a coaching side. That's how I develop my career in businesses, business and specifically sports business. It's just about connections anyway at the end of the day. Literally. Maybe that's where I need to learn a bit because I can definitely be an asshole to some people. And looking back, I've apologized to most of them because, you know, that's where it goes back. I'm stupid. I'm young. I make mistakes, right? And age can't really explain stuff, but it also can to some extent. I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, It's just stuff I have to own up for and Mm -hmm. move on rather than go, let me put that behind me and not learn from it. If I learn from it, I learn from it. Yeah. Because I won't make mistakes in the future. Mm. But, uh. Hopefully it's more on the managerial side in business or esports or sports in general. Whatever it is, we'll see. Love that. Well, I definitely know that for... Is it 20 or 21? 20 or 21? I'm 20. I just turned 20. Oh, my dear. For a 20-year-old, you're looking pretty good for the moment, I think, especially in that yeah. position. Yeah, I've done quite well. So, 
Yeah, you got to back yourself in though, you know. Um, that's all you can do. That's all I'm doing. That's all you can do. So you back it in. You're back in your skill set. You're back in what you know and you use that. Um, and that's all you can do, especially with an esports. You know, a very competitive field. Someday you're there, someday you're not. Um, so you just got to, I guess, yeah, value every experience you enjoy can. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's all you got to do. As much as you know, strength, stress that I get, you just got to enjoy it. So um, yeah, That's what makes life fun is the stresses, though. It is. Do you yeah, imagine it, how boring it would be if we were just like, I don't know. That's why I can't take games casual either. Maybe that's the addictive personality. Yeah. Man, I I can never just hop on a game and be like, all right, let's just have some fun. Nah, <laughs> I, I want to win. I play to win. I've never been a play to have fun person. But I don't know. Maybe that's helped me in my career. Yeah. Well, well, I tweeted out ages ago. I made a tweet, you know, pressure is privilege. And it really is. You know, some people go through life in just a mundane job, just doing whatever they want to do with, with zero pressure and zero whatever and they don't really feel that or oh, you know that burning sensation on their back that they've got to perform or something like that so pressure's a privilege i definitely feel like within esports it definitely is so it's easier to motivate yourself and become a better person if you have pressures as well mm-hmm. like if you don't have anything to wake up for like what, what are you waking up for mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> funny i bring up the waking up thing because that what i've told my players is every single night the next three weeks i want you envisioning one thing Win regional three, envision that, mm-hmm. speak it into existence, say it. Because guess what? Every morning you're gonna wake up and you're gonna go, hmm, what's the goal today? Be better so we can win regional three. That's why I made them start repeating. Not that. That's what we're working for. Let's do it. You know, and it's like it, it gets you excited, it gets you motivated. Because if not, it's like you're just showing up to show up. Showing up just to work sucks. Like I used to do labor, uh, like physical labor as my job. Oh yeah. That was awful. I could not motivate <laughs> myself any morning ever. I didn't have a passion for it. It was good money. It was like a job, and I'm 16. It's like, all right, now I have money, so that's cool. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Money doesn't really motivate me. Winning does. So yeah. We're just competition, whereas a job like that, you don't have competition. You can't really better yourself. It's just, hey, move boxes, fold stuff. Just rinse repeat in it <laughs> yeah it's just boring yeah oh, it's awful yeah yeah i think that's the speciality of esports tournaments lands majors that feeling of when you i guess get your ticket at the airport clipped it's like right here's your ticket to wherever it's like hey on where's your ticket to where go where so you know that feeling it's it's crazy oh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, when you see both of us, we both got a big smile on our face just thinking about it. It's like, oh, <laughs> I love it, man. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, let's let's turn up the gas. Let's wind it down. Now, I've got this question. Everyone, every, every, I ask this for everyone. I'm sure you know that. But for all the guys listening, um, whether they are looking to get into competitive Rocket League, whether they're GC or SSL, looking to push into create a team, around that sort of area, what advice do you have for some of these guys um, who are looking to get into competitive Rocket League? Play. Underst- uh, I think Reynolds has a really good video on it as well. Mm-hmm. Just um, where he did an interview with a high schooler and just talking about it. And it's like co- uh, committing to any competition is lot a lot of sacrifices um i mean for me personally this was when i was working with crimson wings at the time i think was the team which was demo cat skills and prime and then eventually it turned into me working with novus av slash 11 slash what obviously became furia yeah last season i my schedule with balancing life was awful like it would be i'd go to classes for four or five hours a day and then i'd commit to being a better coach and being better at this game for eight, 10 hours a day. That was it. I would, I'd balance school. I'd get homework done. I'd get college done. I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't be a huge social butterfly, but there's that mentality to go, okay, I don't care. Like if I'm having personal successes, if I'm working toward goals, that's what motivates me. Whereas I probably missed out on a lot of stuff. So I wasn't the most social. I wasn't going out. I wasn't, mm-hmm dedicating my time properly and it probably cost me a few relationships looking back yep but uh i guess you can argue maybe those relationships aren't worth it if that person's not understanding but mm. there's also that selfish aspect of okay i personally am not dedicating the time either so can you really fault them for not wanting to commit the time mm-hmm. but um 
I don't know. Committing to any competition, getting the work-life balance is the hardest thing. Yep. Especially when you're on the come up. And something you talked about, like, obviously the younger kids have the time. Once you're at my age or your age, it's like, damn, we don't have the time. Yeah. Like, it, it's hard. You have to make sacrifices. You have to balance. And I'm sure there's even the 14, 15 year olds, like, they regret they can't go out with their friends on weekends. They can't go out at nights because they're scrimming two, three hours a day and they have to play another two, three hours and three play and ranked and yeah. six man, whatever, right? It's not easy as just like play. Like, there is a lot of sacrifices, and you have to be aware of that and just know that. Mm-hmm. And it's something you're willing to commit to, commit to it. But don't go in naive, just like, I can make this work. Yep. And I, I just have to pick up and play, because it's not that easy. Mm. That's probably the best advice. No, I think that's golden, mate. I think that's golden for a lot of people. Because um, <clears throat> I think it's one of the it's one of the real ones, you know. It's a real fact. Um, sacrifices do need to be made with esports, especially if you are looking to be a player. Um, bit different if you're looking to do other stuff in the esports domain, like um, you know AHA or any of that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, especially for a player, you need to have those considerations um, and understand. You know, if it doesn't come through, if it doesn't come to fruition, if you don't be a pro player, what do you have to do to fall back on? What sort of other pathways can you take and, and sort of work around? And I think that's a, a really important thing to consider as well for sure yeah i don't know that's why i did college because i had that as the backup yeah i don't know i believed in myself but it was kind of like you gotta prepare for the worst as well for sure but yeah. yeah it is what it is you live and learn some things come off and some don't but just having that confidence to know what you're gonna do like I don't know. A lot of people don't prepare for the future, which is mm-hmm. wild to me. Or like, don't have backup plans. Like, even people I'm friends with, it's like, I don't know. how You're not ler- nervous riding that line. Like, I always like to have a backup plan of like, if this goes wrong, what am I gonna do? Yeah, for sure. Different people. Hmm. Different spe- Different beasts. <laughs> <laughs> They're just different, man. They're just built different. Um, no, it. awesome. Fantastic. I really appreciate it, Nick. I think it's a phenomenal insight to, to a lot of people who are you know, considering that and uh, considering that pathway for sure, definitely. Um, now, for everyone listening, for all the guys listening on Spotify, Apple, all the podcast platforms you can listen to, Mike, because even on YouTube, on um, where can we find you on all of your fantastic socials? Uh, that's what I was just pulling up on my second monitor, actually, because I got to know this. Uh, my Twitter <laughs> is... My Twitter is at Nick on RL, uh, and I don't think I use any other platforms. No, I don't stream. I don't use is there even any other apps. Twitch, Twitter. Insta? You got an Insta? Bro, I don't use my Insta. That's my <laughs> personal stuff. Gotcha. YouTube, I don't upload. Coaches can't do content. Uh, what else? No, it's literally just my Twitter, at Nick on RL. Okay legendary well that's pretty easy for the for everyone listening to to find it i'll chuck some links in the episode as well so that'll be nice and accessible um but look nick fantastic episode i really appreciate you coming on a lot of fantastic insights and sort of information that a lot of people might not have uh, known about you um and also i guess about your mindset towards uh rocket league coaching but also coaching you know everyday life and i guess your goals and individual motivations that sort of strive you to be who you want to be and, and that journey that you take um so i think it's phenomenal and i really appreciate you jumping on brother Man, this is fun. Uh, we'll, we'll have more conversations, whether it be in London or Dallas or wherever. Oh, for sure. Maybe Saudi Arabia. What do you we'll, mean? We'll figure it out. See what happens. It's all love, brother. And then this is, I, I imagine me two years ago would have been like, man, I'm not getting interviewed for anything. I was <laughs> lengthy or random. And now <laughs> this, is, this is just unreal how everything's progressed. For but sure, brother. It, brother. Nah, for sure, brother. Anytime. Make sure that. Um, <clears throat> that uh, you enjoy your day and I'll uh, I'll catch everyone in the next episode. Peace out. Peace.